General Conference 2015, a daily report by LLBN with Dr. Calvin Rock and Hannah Luttrell. And now, GC 2015, LLBN, daily report. Hi and welcome back. We're coming to you from the 60th General Conference session from the convention floor right here in San Antonio, Texas. I'm here with Dr. Rock to bring you the daily LLBN report from the GC. Dr. Rock, how's the, how's the atmosphere going right now? Excellently. The tensions about the big debate on Wednesday are building. I started to say the battle lines are being drawn, but that's not a good way to introduce a subject so uh, important and, of course, something that has great spiritual significance as well. Right. But in a way, philosophically, the lines are hardening. People have their decisions and their desires, and we'll see how all that comes out. But I've noticed something, Hannah. Yeah. I think that um, most delegates have an incorrect uh, assumption about the question that will be on the floor Wednesday morning. And of course, that's tomorrow morning. Uh, the fact is that the question on the floor is not shall we ordain women. The question on the floor is, is it okay or is it all right for each division to make that decision? And can we live with a church in which among our 13 divisions there will be different decisions or that different divisions will function along this line so that some division will say yes we will ordain women and some will say no we will not that is the question for me uh, that's a much more logical and a much less divisive way of going about it because we won't have to have a line in the sand decision on that by people who by culture or theological beliefs or whatever disagree and I was reading this morning from Psalm 133 which says oh how good and pleasant it is for brethren members to dwell together in unity and it occurred to me that unity does not mean unison so if the decision is that some divisions may ordain women we can still have unity and if the decision is that some divisions may not let's hope that unity will prevail even so that's right so if it's a no vote, um, what, and if it's a yes vote, what will happen in either, in either case? Well, if it's a yes vote, it simply means that some divisions, those where the decision is yes, we will and should ordain women, those divisions will do so. Those divisions where they believe it is not the thing to do will not do so. And we'll live with that, hopefully. Of course, the big question there, I should mention before we leave that topic, is what happens when an ordained woman transfers to a division where ordination is not recognized. But I think that's uh, a problem that can be more easily resolved than some others. So tomorrow is a big day. It is. It doesn't yeah. define us as Seventh-day Adventists or what's happening at this 60th general conference but it certainly is the topic of the day it's in the hallways it's what they call the elephant in the room right yeah you know the issue has come up in uh, previous days as well uh, as you mentioned yesterday um, there was uh, some discussion about in the church over the church manual and its description of who can conduct a communion service um, currently I believe it said um, ordained pastors and or what, ordained elders. Or ordained elders. Yes. Was that yes. clarified, Dr. Rock? Yes. Uh, we had a plethora of decisions regarding the church manual on yesterday, and they're still being made today. And one of them had to do with who can conduct a communion service. The wording of the manual seemed to indicate that it had to be an ordained elder or an ordained pastor or a commissioned pastor. But the question came as to whether or not a commissioned pastor who is not an ordained elder could do it. And the decision was made that yes, uh, communion should or can be conducted by an ordained elder, an ordained pastor, and 
an ordained commission pastor, which means that the commission pastor, whether it be a male or a female, should also be an ordained elder. Easy to understand or? Right, yeah, that makes <laughs> okay. sense. Okay, that's the way it goes. Okay, that, that was clarified, that's great. Um, what other changes to the church manual have we seen so far? What decisions have you made there? Well, along with that, there was uh, the whole discussion about membership and uh, the decision was made that an individual who wishes to have his or her name removed from the church may do so by letter on which the church board will act without taking it to the full church business session. Prior to this, no matter how a member was leaving or being asked to leave the membership of the church, only the church in business session could affect that or approve that. But now, if a member wishes to have his or her name removed, a letter to the church board can do it, and the church board does not have to take that letter to the full membership. Uh, another change had to do with uh, individuals put on probation or censure. Okay. There's been a struggle for years as we have refined the church manual as to whether or not there should be certain time periods for a person who is on probation. As you know, there are two ways that members may be disciplined. One is to be simply relieved uh, or taken away or put out of the church, we call it. Another is to be put on probation, which is censure. In this latest decision, there is no specific time element for censure. In the old days, an individual had to be put on censure for six months or a year. More recently, it could have been less than that. Now the manual does not reference any specific time period. It leaves it up to the church and says that when the member shows evidence of repentance and willingness to live by the doctrines of the church in a faithful way, then that individual can be restored. But it does say further, there is another action that says an individual that has been placed on either censorship or even rebaptized because of sexual assault should never be put into a position where they have a close relationship to children or those who are vulnerable. That individual can have other offices in the church, but no office that makes it difficult for him or her or for the little ones to have confidence and respectability. All right, I'm glad that that was stated. That's good for the protection yes. of our members. Yes. Great. So uh, the church manual changes have been substantive and they have generated a lot of debate, but right. these are some of the major decisions of yesterday. Right. I uh, hear this morning there was some discussion about a change to one of our fundamental beliefs, fundamental, fundamental belief number six, that has to do with creation. Uh, I know we don't have a full report yet because that just happened, but um, any summary you can give our viewers? Yes, that? what I understand is that the words literal is going to be added and uh, the, the verbiage will indicate that yes, again reaffirming that God works six days. He by fiat created this world, rested the seventh day and uh, that this is our fundamental that we will in fact retain as is with only the reassurance that is literal and a short and recent, recent uh, activity. Now, right. of course, that gets into the age of the earth. Is it 6,000 or 10,000? I think, as we heard from our interview with Dr. Clausen the other day, we don't really try to tie it down to any specific period, but a short-term period, and that's what our fundamental will indicate. I see. Great. Well, one of the other big um, decisions that we made recently is the election or re-election of some of the vice presidents yes. of the General Conference. What yes. update do you have on that? As you remember, there were four resignations and uh, two individuals who were not recommended for reappointment by the nominating committee and three new vice presidents. 
and that has been accomplished along with six new division presidents and there are also 12 new department directors so it's a real substantive and substantial turnover in leadership of our church right yeah um, do you have any background on these individuals or names of these individuals yeah um, our latest review and they give us this every morning that uh, does give some detail the new uh, vice presidents I'll read you their names are Pastor Biaggi, Pastor Los Santos, and Pastor Lemon, Thomas Lemon, and Abner de Los Santos, and Jumero E. Biaggi. So these are the new ones. The ones who've been retained are Joffrey Mbana, and Ella Simmons, and Arthur Stille. Right. Okay, great. I hear among the division presidents uh, that Dan Jackson of the North American Division was re-elected. Ah, you're ahead of me. I didn't know that, <laughs> but I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. We right. were all hoping that would be the case. Okay. Well, it's a little close to home being right here in North America, so he's going to be um, leading the North American division for the next quinquennium. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a very popular choice. Uh, there was some trepidation, but hey, we're happy. <laughs> Now, last night, uh, two other divisions gave their reports, um, the Inter-European Division and the Inter-American Division. Um, could you give us a bit of background about who's in these divisions and maybe a summary of what was reported? Yes, the Inter-American Division, of course, uh, is always the most colorful of any of our divisions that are reporting. Well, I'd better be careful. I don't <laughs> want to be accused of any... Uh, leaning here but the fact is for me at least they've always been among the more if not the most colorful of all the divisions all right. what are some of the countries in the inter-american division the inter-american division has all of the countries in latin america and uh they have the nations of the caribbean these are the main components of the inter-american division okay. and it is as i said a colorful and dynamic part of our work let me read you here again from um, our Bible of, of reports. Uh, there are 42 countries in the Inter-American Division. That's a lot of countries. 42. And there are 122 local fields and uh, more than a million members were baptized in this one division during the last quinquennium. Wow, the that's The last incredible. five years. And of course, that included 12 unions, new unions that they added, meaning that Inter-America now has 24 unions, 24 unions, compared with the 10, if I'm correct, that we have here in North America. So it's a vast field and uh, influences the work of the church in a lot of ways. Inter-America, of course, is uh, colorful because it is both Latin America and Caribbean. And there's been some thought of dividing these into unions themselves, but they've decided to stick together through the years and they still are. Okay. Very great. What about the um, inter-European um, group? What's, what's new with them? The inter-European is another fascinating part of the world as you know, this used to be called the uh, Euro-Africa Division uh -huh. in which they placed together nations in Europe with nations in Africa. And that was always a bit of a stretch right, yeah. <laughs> for a lot of us and for them as they tried to conduct their work. Right. But so, here so they divided. in 2011, they took the African and uh, the Middle East countries or the countries in the Middle East area and put them in the divisions now accommodating those countries. Okay. So that leaves for the what is now still called EUD, or that's the acronym EUD, but it is now called the Inter European Division. Okay. It gives them a lot of more continuity because the countries are contiguous. 
they're there together and they don't have to go flying to Africa to conduct their work. They now have 178,000 members, not a lot. They started the Quinquinium with about 176. So it's not a huge growth in membership. And uh, one can understand when you consider the, the countries involved, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Italy, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, Switzerland, a lot of countries where Christianity is not all that popular and where secularism is very strong and the work doesn't explode as it does in Africa and into America right. and some of the other places we've mentioned. So this is a major change and a welcome change in terms of our administrative configuration. I see, right. Oh, well, it's great to hear that um, the growth is slow, they have lots of challenges, but things are happening and uh, we'll continue to keep them in our prayer as well as the Inter-American Division that we've covered as well. Yes, this is a dynamic church. It's a marvelous organization. And I, I, won, I, I for one, am just always amazed at the way our policies structure our interaction all of these different cultures and people in all these countries to be cemented together by the hope that is within us the blessed hope of something better life in a better world and the sabbath and the tithing and all the other good reforms that make us who we are and now to see how it functions in the in the inner workings of our conference structures as we see it right here, is a marvel, and we praise God. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Rock. Well, now we're going to go to some of the floor interviews that Dr. Rock and I have done. We've gone around and captured some of the interesting stories from right here on the convention floor. So if it's okay, we'll roll those right now. Hello. I am back on the interview trail here, and I'm standing in the midst of a vigorous group of folk called Share Him. And some of you know what Share Him is all about, but meanwhile, let's make sure everybody knows. Tell us, what is Share Him all about? Uh, Share Him is a ministry uh, of people from around the world who have gone to different destinations to preach and share God's word. So who pays your way when you're going all around the world? You pay your own way, or how, how do you do that? Yes, we pay our own way. So it's strictly volunteer, including your tickets? Is that a fact? Your parents help you, no doubt. <laughs> So somebody's got to be helping. You don't look like, well, I can't say you don't look rich, but maybe, maybe you are. And uh, what are your names? I'm Daniel. Daniela. Nikki. Wait a minute. Daniel, you're twins or something? Daniel, Daniel. <laughs> Just hap happens to be that way. And you, ma'am? Marietta. Marietta, are you one of the leaders, chaperones, directors? What is your role? I make babysitter. <laughs> oh, the pastor kids, yes. You're the babysitter. Yeah. But, the, the, but these aren't babies. They're pretty grown-ups. I two sons, and he can preach when I stay by the babies. So the you, woman to make the same. All right, all right, that works. And you are? And? And? I am Purity. And? Daniel. And you, sir, are the boss. Oh, I'm Pastor Luis Leonor, one of the field secretary for Shahim, helping see. with this group in Mexico. I see. So the group has been to Mexico. Yes. What, did, what did they do in Mexico? Uh, we have about 200 young people from Europe preaching in different cities in Mexico, in the south of Mexico. Wonderful. What a wonderful church this is that nourishes its young people, encourages volunteerism. And is everybody, well, you're not all from the same country. I hear different accents. I hear German. What else do I hear here? Um, what for us three? Of us three are from England. Three from England. How many from Germany? Oh, yeah. Four from Germany. Yeah, but our group is bigger. Our group is bigger. We are 19 from England. And how many and from Germany? Eight. 20. 20. 20 from Germany. So how did you get to San Antonio? You paid your own way here as well? <laughs> Who helped you? Well, it was the organization of Shehim. They, they gave us this opportunity to come to San Antonio and speak about Shehim as well. 
Thank you for sharing him in your work around the world and for sharing with us today on Loma Linda Broadcast Network. A lot of people are going to hear this, and I hope a lot of young people will be encouraged to enjoy what you do in sharing him. God bless you each. Thank Thanks you a million. All. Thank you all. All right. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, an example of what Christian education does and of what good home training will do for our youth. Don't let anybody tell you that all of our young people are leaving the church. we got a lot of energy and talent in our youth. We must nourish them, nurture them, encourage them, and as you can see, we have great results. God bless you, and God bless you. I'm here now in the midst of all the sounds and sights at San Antonio in the Convention Center with Victor Issa, artist and sculptor. We are privileged to have you occupy this prominent corner, sir. And all of these are your creations? They are. Now, tell us a little bit about them and how you got the inspiration. And I know that some of these are already instituted at our institutions in the States and maybe other places. Help yep. us out. Right. This one is called the Prince of Peace. That was commissioned for Union College. Uh, this one is called Fit for Eternity. That was commissioned for uh, Southern Adventist University. And this is part of a sculpture I did for Adventist Health in Florida, uh, mm. Healing in Bethesda. And the front small piece there is called uh, Come Unto Me, and that's for Loma Linda University. Wonderful. Just absolutely gorgeous. And when you say commission, you mean they're already on site. Correct. The life size of them. The life size? Of, uh, of these two here. These are smaller. Where do you get the inspiration? Uh, God, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I sit and meditate on the thought that the uh, uh, institution would like to portray, and and uh, usually God sends me th the picture in my mind, and this is what it would look good, and sometimes we get more input from the client as well. Are you responsible for that splendid sculpture in the foyer at the General Conference building? Right, right. King, the king is coming. You're the man. Right. And what about these behind us? Well, this is the king is coming up here. And this is the life size of Come Unto Me, the one at Loma Linda. Uh, this sculpture here is called Eden Restored. That's for the Porter Care Adventist Health System in, in the Denver area. And that's the one, uh, the life size of uh, Adventist Health, uh, the healing of Bethesda. So you are really putting these in institutions all over the states. What about overseas? There are some pieces overseas with private clients. I don't have any in the, our institutions overseas yet. Where is your office? I am uh, stationed in Loveland, Colorado, which is 50 miles north of Denver. I see to my left here something that looks extraordinary. Uh, they're all extraordinary, but this stands out at least in terms of its size and its position here right in the middle of things in the uh, concourse here in San Antonio. Tell us what this is all about, please. I call this one the heart of God. And it's a depiction of um, Jesus with Mary Magdalene. And he is telling her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Absolutely gorgeous. Brothers and sisters, I wish you could be here. You can almost touch it and see it. I've never seen anything like it. And there are tears coming out of Mary's eyes and the compassion of our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Issa. God bless you in the work you do. It's, it's marvelous to see that kind of creation. The only thing I can imagine is that in the earth made new, there might be some, well, yes, there will be something better. <laughs> but I don't think this side of the earth made new or heaven will we see anything more like the real. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time. Ladies and gentlemen, another example of the talent that God has placed in the minds and the hands of our brothers and sisters in our wonderful family of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wish you were here to see it, but this is the next best thing. And thank you again. Thank you God bless. I'm here today with Elder Paul Surrender Gill. He is currently the General Vice President of the Columbia Union Chapter of the ASI Ministry. Elder Paul, thanks for being here. Tell me how your journey started to where you are today. Well, I was 19 years old. I had no interest in the religion because my, my parents were not uh, practicing Christians. 
So therefore, I had no uh, no interest. Also, matter of fact, uh, in my area where the Christians are not very well respected, so I wanted to stay away from Christian people. Although he was, I was from the Christian family. Accidentally, I met a Seventh Day Adventist pastor, B. M. Mull. Uh, I was looking for a room uh, to prepare my high school. So he said, okay, we won't charge you anything provided you uh, join with us for the family worship every Friday. And uh, I said, okay, I have no problem because I was interested in only saving money but no interest in the Bible. Over the period of time, I start developing some kind of interest in the Bible and learning to, so I can go back and ask questions to my father. The more I learned, the more I w went to ask questions to my father, he starts getting annoyed with me. And uh, he, he told that, uh, suddenly you became interested in the Bible, you never opened the Bible. But my, in, in my mother's heart, she was very happy. So, so I, to, I brought him to my village and I said I would like to have bring Adventist movement to my village because this is something that it is on the Bible based. So my father said, no, you cannot bring, but he was out of, out of town. I brought the, <laughs> brought the uh, pastor, went door to door and asking people to come. And this, this pastor has only something interesting, which is the truth that we never knew before. So people came on and off, but suddenly when my father came to know that this pastor is coming regularly, and uh, they told me that I cannot bring this pastor uh, to our home eventually, but I continued studying uh, the Bible with him and I started sharing with my cousin and my nephew. And in the end, we all three became Seventh-day Adventists. How did your dad react when he heard that? Okay, he said, okay, you have to leave the room, uh, leave the house and no financial support uh, to use. So I went to a mission station. I told that this is the problem I'm facing. And uh, they said, okay, we have a, a call poetry program where you and your nephew can go and sell books and maybe you should go to college. So we, we did work and we went to college and I finished the college and then also the MBA program. Then I came to United States. Before I came here, we built a church there with my canvassing money the uh, small church. Wow, so you started the Adventist movement in your village in the northern India and you started the first Adventist church there. What are you doing today for that community? Okay, today for the community, even though I am physically in the United States, but my heart is still with my people over there. And uh, we annually contribute to that project there. My project is coming up in two years to take a mission trip there and build uh, built a school and clinic and uh, and while I will have more time because by trade I am a hospital administrator in Washington DC so we, I will have enough time and I have my own ministry now Good News Ministry International so I have not finished with them yet <laughs> you still sounds like you still have a lot to do for God's work yeah I have a lot I will continue to do I think there are a lot to do in that particular territory. There are only 2% Christians there and only half of the half percent Seventh-day Adventists. All right. Well, thank you for sharing and thank you for your passion for God's work in your hometown in India. And that's it today from Elder Paul Gill. And I hope his testimony has inspired you to be faithful and to share God with others. We thank you for joining us for this edition of the LLBN Daily GC Report. And we'll be coming to you live every evening, 7 p.m. Pacific time and it'll be repeated throughout the day at the times on the screen. Till then we'll join you next time. Bye bye.